We're back to Neil Haley Show, and I'm excited to welcome my pro the program, my co-host, David Hollenbeck. David, thanks for stopping by. I know you're excited about our guest and introduce our great guest. I mean, just some of the projects he's worked on just blows me away. And some of the connects we I have run into in my career of doing over 14 years of interviews and so many celebrities, he has met some amazing people and he's a celebrity and myself for myself. I have to consider him that with some of the, the amazing people he's worked with. Go ahead, David, with introducing our guest. Yeah. Man, I, I am really excited about this. Arthur Smith, uh, we're going to talk about his upcoming book, Reach Hard Lessons and Learn Truths from a Lifetime in Television. Um, currently, I, you know, and to look at you, Arthur, it, it's hard to believe that you've been in showbiz for 40 years. I mean, <laughs> would you start when you were 10? Oh, thanks for thanks for that. No, you know, I worked for Dick Clark and and he gave me that special serum, you know, that Dick Clark serum, you know, the old America's oldest living teenager. So uh I, I don't know, I guess it's good genetics, but but thank you. Thank you. Thank thanks for saying that. I wow, mean, Dick you... Clark, it started with Dick Clark. Holy cow, go ahead, Dave, <laughs> your question. But yeah, let's see. Uh, talk about the list of people he knows, but go ahead, Dave, with your next question. No, I mean Dick, two, Dick, two sorry, Dick. Dick got me my green card. So there's a whole story about that. But Dick got me my green card. So uh and I'm and you know, one of the most important mentors of my life. But sorry, I interrupted you. No, I mean, I, I was just gonna touch on the 200 plus shows for 50 plus networks. Uh, I mean, you've created some of the longest running unscripted series in history, including Hell's Kitchen, uh, the seven-time Emmy nominee American Ninja Warrior. Um, I, I mean the list goes on and on, and I, I, <laughs> I'm just thrilled to be talking to you. Uh, the Titan Games with with Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I mean, that's one of uh, Neil's buddies there. So no, he wore my knee pads. I wish he <laughs> you need to tell him that when I was down south uh, working in in Memphis uh, for when he before he was the Rock. But yeah, go ahead, go, go with your question, Dave. That's funny. <laughs> no, I I wanted to my first question. Uh, for Arthur is, um, who is this book for? Yeah, well, um, you know, I um, I wrote this book really for a broad audience, to be honest with you. I'm sure there's a sweet spot for people who are interested in pop culture and, and uh, behind the scenes of what's happening in sports and what's happening in entertainment. Um, and yes, it's filled with some great stories, stories that I never told before with Dwayne Johnson and Gordon Ramsay and, and Dick Clark and Simon Cowell and Magic Johnson and Wayne Gretzky. I, there's a lot of people in the book, but, you know, it is a memoir with a purpose. You know, I didn't, you know, take the greatest stories I've ever had or the funniest stories, although I think they're some of the greatest and some of the fun, funniest or at least most interesting. But the purpose is, is, is explaining what, what I believe um, is really important. Um, and it's been important in my life is that the power of reach. And that's why the book is called Reach. I believe when you reach, um, that's your chance at achieving your full potential. Um, I believe when you reach, you find out what you're capable of. Sometimes when you reach and you think it's sometimes outside your grasp, you you actually find out that you can do it. Um, I believe when you reach, you realize the difference between a, a, a pipe dream and what you haven't dared to try just yet. And so every story in the book um, is about some connection to this power of rage, something that I discovered. I was fortunate because I discovered it when I was very young. Um, it may not sound like it right now, but I was the shyest of all kids. I was incredibly shy. So shy, I was the kid my parents worried about. And something happened very early on in my life, and I talk about it in the book, um, when I was nine years old. And it it changed my life. And I was never the same. And I didn't, I was nine years old. So I, I wasn't consciously aware of what was happening. It was all subconscious, but it did lead me on this path and this path. I mean, I grew up in Montreal, you know, I, there was no connection in the entertainment business. My mother was a housewife. My dad was a manufacturer. So there was no connection to the enter entertainment business. In fact, because I was so shy, television kept me company. Television was my friend. And so I would watch endless hours of television. And I still do. I am a TV holic. My name is Arthur Smith and I'm a TV holic. I can't stop watching it. I love content. I consume it by the, by the tons. And, you know, all this, um, all this, like I said, played out. And when I look back through my life and I looked at, 
you know, what was the thing that I can draw from one thing to the next? It was this power of rage. And um, anyhow, that was a really long answer to a very short question. I apologize. No, but you I see love the shy it. Kids, we shy have kids not shy anymore. Parts. We have to have 16 parts, Arthur, for, for sure. And when you think about specifically the power of reach, I mean, I look at it like the experiences that we have in our lives. Now, I'm 50 years old now. You know, I was a former professional wrestler, former teacher. All the experience that I had always constantly have tried to strive for more and more opportunities have come through taking chances, through going and developing relationships and looking at things. How would you define people that are not doing what you say in the name, the power of reach? What do you think it is? Is not having the highest expectations for yourself, settling for less, not knowing the possibilities that can be out there for people? Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. You know, um, sometimes people overanalyze. I mean, I think, you know, so many of the breaks that I got, especially early on, I have to admit it came out of ignorance. I didn't know how the business worked. I just knew I wanted in. And so some of the things that I did, like my first job at CBC, um, you know, years ago, I grew up in Montreal and I was living in Toronto. I was still still in college studying TV and film. I didn't know how the business worked, but I knew I wanted to work at CBC Sports. I'm a big sports fan. I love television first. Sports is my second love. And I literally camped outside someone's office for five or six hours. I didn't know how it worked. I knew I wanted to see him. I knew I didn't have an appointment. I knew I wouldn't, they wouldn't let me in. And I waited till he came out of the office and... I mean, had I known any better, had I known what I knew years ago, I would have probably never done this, but I was so ignorant that I thought, I've got to find a way to meet this guy. And I said, can I just, when he finally came out, I said, can I have 10 minutes of your time? He's like, give you five. And the five minutes turned into 90 minutes. And then at the end of it, he goes, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a producer. And he said, well, that's a good lifelong goal. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready now. Ignorant. Once again, I am ignorant. And he goes, well, that's not the way it works. You have to work in, you have to be a PA and you have to work in local news and then you have to work your way around. And it was a whole, whole thing. I said, well, how long does that take? And he goes, fast track five years. And so um, when I heard that, I said, well, I'm, I'm not interested, ignorant person that I was. And, and that was it. And I said, okay. But a few weeks later, <laughs> I got a phone call from his boss. And I was I was brought back to Toronto. I actually went to Montreal to see my family. And I went, actually literally turned around the car. I got to Montreal, got this message on my answering machine, and then turned around because I didn't have a cell phone because I'm old. It was way back in the 80s. Anyhow, I turned around, drove back to uh, drove back to Toronto, and I had this meeting with all the executives, the head guys at CBC Sports, kind of guys that I looked up to because I was in a, you know, dreamed of being a producer like them. And um, they ended up hiring me and they, I was this experiment and I ended up being a producer and I was very young and ended up directing, uh, being the replay director on Hockey Night in Canada, which in Canada is everything. And then produced the Los Angeles Olympics when I was 24. And then somehow I ended up as head of the sports division. I was president of CBC Sports. I was 28 years old. And all of this happened because I put myself out there, because I raged. And not only did I reach with, you know, within that first meeting, but continually. And this is this has been the pattern. I believe we make our good fortune. And Neil, you're right. Sometimes, you know, maybe people overthink it and and overanalyze it to the point that they get stuck in neutral. It's and too neutral simple. Too it's simple. They want to look at these experts that say you need to have this in all place. Everything needs to be in place. BS. It's about who you know going after it and asking and building and using your talents to what's your best, your ability. People yeah. overthink things so much. They think they need a specific guru to, you know, change things. And I got to follow this prescription plan. You talk to any famous person and I've talked to, you've talked to a ton. I've talked to a ton. It isn't based on a specific prescriptive plan. They came up with it. They went for it and they kept, grinding and that opportunity came and then they took that opportunity for another opportunity it wasn't like you know how these coaches are out there these business coaches the other people you got to have it specifically this plan if you don't follow this plan it's not going to work that's not the case it's about believing nope. and going after it and and doing things that are not like the average everyday person does am i right am i on the right track and looking at this reach thing yeah I 
Yes, I, I think you are. I definitely think you are. I mean, I think that, you know, um, listen, it, just because you want something doesn't make it so. Just because you're reaching for it doesn't make you so. There are lots of stories in the book, and I talk a lot about some of the successes, but I talk about my failures too. But I, I believe everything happens for a reason. I believe the more you try, the luckier you get. And, and I believe um, that, that, like I said, that you don't, you don't achieve your full potential unless you reach beyond what you think you can do. And that's happened to me time and time again. I also, you know, believe that, and I, I, I've been blessed because I believe that it's much easier to reach from a strong foundation. And, you know, when you think of, um, you know, and when I talk, when I'm talking about that, I'm really talking about my parents because I had great parents and they, um, they were very supportive and they gave me the confidence and, you know, um, they gave me the confidence to reach. And all through my life, I, even though I lived thousands of miles, my, my parents lived in Canada. I lived in, I've been living in LA for 30 years. You know, we spoke every day and, and I went through, I went through a lot in my career. It was, you know, I was young and I was uh, producing and directing, uh, it, you know, when I was very young and the pressure was pretty intense and my parents were always there for me. And now it's been my family. My parents are gone. Um, and, um, and listen, uh, you know, I, I think about the analogy is like, you know, think about like when you're standing on top of a solid table and you're trying to change a light bulb, it's much easier to change the light bulb when the table is solid, right? As opposed to a wobbly table that's not secure and you're trying to change the light bulb. And so, you know, it, you know, it doesn't have to be your parents. It, for some people, for me, I was blessed with parents. I had it in my house. So I was already, um, I already had a good base to stand on and, and, um, and for some people like who, who aren't as fortunate, you know, um, it can come in other ways. It can come from friends. It come from siblings. It come from something, but it's very, it is very difficult when your, your life away from what you're doing is not stable. It, there's no question about it. And, and it's not impossible. It's just easier. So, um, I was fortunate to to be reaching from a strong foundation and it helped me. It helped me tremendously. And, and that's why the book is dedicated to my parents and the book is dedicated to the five women in my life, which is I, I have two older sisters, I have two daughters and my wife, who's amazing. And all of them, um, they keep me grounded and they keep me sane because I'm nuts. I'm crazy. Like, I, I have this restless thing. You know, it's funny, you know, in my producing life, some of my some of the qualities that help me make people crazy outside of my work, because I'm OCD, I'm incredibly impatient, um, and I'm restless. So at work, it really works well, because I believe, I believe impatient people get there faster. So, so I'm like, I'm always, always want things faster. You know, outside of work, it's, you know, it's, I, I can, I can be challenging. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm a good husband. I'm a good dad, but I'm, I'm a little nuts. You know, my wife is the same one. And, She's amazing, and she she uh, she puts up with me. Our, so. Uh, there's so much to talk about. Go ahead, David. Your question. This is the kind of conversation that you know you could just have a, a cup of coffee. I come out to LA. I definitely want to hang out one point when I'm in LA. To, sure. So I'm six foot ten, by the way. Former pro wrestler, as I said. So I'm six ten, big guy. You know, and uh, I got stories just like you, Arthur. But go ahead, David. Your question. Well. You mentioned this event when you were nine years old. Uh, I'm curious, mm -hmm. do you mind sharing that? Is that when your dad brought your first TV home or? No, 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 no. It actually <laughs> happened. Um, it happened on the ice. As a true Canadian, I was playing hockey. And like I said, the, we had just moved five miles. We had moved from uh, um, um, five miles. That's That was it. From one suburb to another of Montreal. But for me, it was traumatic. This shy kid moving from the friends that I had into a new neighborhood and I wouldn't leave the house. I was, I was not, I was not in a good way. And my parents didn't know what to do with me. And, and, uh, and I, I felt bad about it. I remember feeling bad about it, but I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. And, but I did play sports and I was, I was a, I was, I, I, I was a defenseman because it was, I, I didn't want to be in the limelight. And um, and they put me in a, they 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 put me in a hockey league in this new neighborhood, and um, the, the the coach looked at me and he said, um, "We don't need any more defensemen. You're playing center." I said, "No, no, no, no. I'm a defenseman." And I was nine years old, so how can I argue with the coach? So I I, I ended up playing center, and um, in my first game, I just survived, and in my second game, a crazy thing happened. I scored the winning goal of the game. 
-hmm. And all of a sudden I had friends. All of a sudden I said, well, maybe I should be putting myself out there. And I know it's such a weird thing, but I got to tell you, I mean it sincerely. That changed my life. I went on to become the leading scorer in the league. I don't think I ever scored a goal before that season. I was a defenseman who just did my job. I was one of the leading scorers in the league. And that led me to sports. And, and, and I started to realize, you know what? I kind of like the limelight. I kind of like being in the spotlight. I kind of like all this. And, and all of a sudden, confidence happens. And confidence such a, is such a big... Such confidence a big is thing. the youth thing. You could literally, Arthur, it's the bottom line. If you're not surrounded with the right people and they bring you down, that destroys yes. everything around yes. you and you don't. And when you figure that super genius, uh, one of my mentors, DJ Reynolds, talked about flow. you got to have flow around you. If you're not having lots of negativity, because you're going to have hard times. If you're going to try to strive for greatness... You're going to hit that wall. You're going to hit that wall many times. You got to have surround yourself with the right people around you because it's not the normal thing of a day to nine to five job. We're going through things and we can escape. The days are over. When you're trying to reach for greatness, whatever you do, mm -hmm. you're going to yeah. have those tough times. You're going to have those, those, those moments where you want to give up, but you got to come back, but you got to have the people around you that yeah. believe in you. Yeah. And, that, but, yeah. and, and, and that's the, the key thing. And I mean, you talk, I'm sure what have you been when you've talked to people that have read the book so far, Arthur, or have had the conversations and, and met with you? What do they say based on why you've written this book and talked, told the story? What are the, your friends, your colleagues, people around you, even yeah. people who have written the books, yeah. have read the book so far? Well, the book's just out. So, okay. you know, it just came out recently. So, but there have been some people who've read it and you know, I love my friends and family and, um, you know, I love their opinions and they all, they all love the book, but, but, but something happened to me and it was the first blessing, um, of writing the book. I was doing the audio, the audio book about a month ago and people have a choice to buy the book or not, right? You know, I'm to buy it. There's people listening today. They're, they're going to either like what I'm saying or, or, or not. And they're, they have a choice to buy the book. The person who doesn't have a choice but has to hear the book is the audio engineer. He has no choice. He's got to sit there for four days, and it's his job. He's got to mix it. He's got to make sure the levels are there. And so for four days, you know, I'm, I met this guy, and, you know, there was, a, there was a, you know, someone from the publishing company listening, listening in, and I'm doing my thing, and I'm doing the, reading the whole book four days, seven hours a day, got it done. And I get out of the the soundstage and right before I leave, he comes up to me and he goes, I, th I think you've changed my life. I think you've changed my life. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. I need to push further. I realize that I'm limiting myself. I realize that I haven't reached in my life and listening to you for the last few days has changed me. I swear I got emotional. I gave the guy a hug. I was like, Oh my God. I was like, I was like shaking when he said this to me because you know, it's like, it's this technician who, this is what he does. He listens to the books and mixes shows. And, and like he, like I said, he had no choice but to listen to me. So, um, so that got to me. And I'm, I'm, listen, I'm really hoping that the book is entertaining. And I think it is. And I mean, certainly it's, it's got a lot of interesting people. And it's, you know, I have this great story with Magic Johnson of, that I did something with magic and 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 seeing him and 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 you know really telling people what the real magic is like and the same thing with Dwayne and Dwayne Johnson and and Little Richard I, who was wow. I got a crazy story of Little Richard I mean there's a lot of really interesting subject matter and then by the way there are stories about people who aren't famous who had an impact on my life as well so I I hope it entertains people I re I'm really hoping it inspires people and that's why when you know when you ask me the first question about who's it for I really hope it's for everybody. I really do. I mean, I mean, I, I hope every. I think people are into you know the pop culture and and uh, you know of it all. Um, and and uh, certainly if if you're a budding producer, I just was at a television convention. I just did a keynote at a television convention this morning, and yes, that was my sweet spot because these are people who want to work in the industry. But I'm really hoping it's really for more than that. I don't. The things that I talk about, yes, they're examples from sports and from the entertainment business. But they're really, you know, examples that I think you can apply to your life, to anyone's life, if you want to grow your game, at least from my perspective. Okay, good, David. Another question. I I really enjoyed this, Arthur, just 
Totally amazing. But go, David, your next question. I'm going to have one, hit one more question for Arthur after that, because I have a half hour show and sometimes it's 15 minutes and, you know, it just all varies. I, I, I created this thing and I'm happy I created it. That's 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 my thing. And uh, go ahead, David, with your question. So the thing that I want to know is how you came up with I Survived a Japanese Game Show. Well, talk about a reach. <laughs> um, you know, when I went to, when I talked to ABC about it, it was like, they looked at me like I had two heads. So, um, there was an executive there that at ABC at the time who was into all things Japan. And we started talking about, you know, television in Japan, which is completely different. Um, the game shows in particular that what, of what goes on in Japan. And we started to say, well, you know, what would happen if we took 16 Americans and they didn't know why they were on a show. They just knew they were on a competition show and brought them to Japan. And um, and the interesting thing, um, you know, he was he he got it. Um, he was scared of it, and and so was I. But we started. He said, "Why don't you write a a show bible?" Which is basically the, you know, in television, you know, before they give you a pilot, it's kind of like they call it paper development, basically. And we wrote this Bible, never ever going to Japan to do any work because they didn't give us any money. It was a small fee to do paper development. We wrote this Bible, it's like a 40 page Bible on what the show would be, what the challenges would be. And I actually was on location shooting Kitchen Nightmares with Gordon Ramsay. I remember where I was, I was in the control room. I got a phone call from ABC and, and, he, and it was this guy, Johnson's Day. And he says, I just read the Bible. So did Steve McPherson, who's president of the network and we're laughing hysterically. Um, Can you do this show? And I go, yeah, of course. And, and this was like February, he goes, we need it on the air in June. I go, I, I, I could, could, could did you say June? I said, I, I've never been to Japan. I just like, this is, I don't even know if it's possible. I need a little, and then they said, listen, it's the NBA playoffs and it's the summer and it's the final and we want to promote it. And I said, the end of June? They go, yes, the end of June. I said, okay, it's marginally better, but fine. Can I call you back tomorrow? I called them back. Reach. Reach, I just, I called back the next day with not much more information and said, yeah, we can do it. And um, it was challenging and difficult and and special because we actually pulled it off. As a matter of fact, we had a couple of people who were working on the show who quit because they thought they were going to be out of work because they never thought we were going to get into production. They actually quit the show. And I kept saying, it's going to happen. We're going to Japan. And sure enough, we shot the show. It was an amazing journey. Um, it, it, the story is because it is such an interesting, crazy reach, it's in the book. Um, and the show goes on to win the format of the year. It won the Rose Door Award as format of the year. And, you know, it wasn't our biggest hit. We did a couple of seasons of it. Um, the novelty started to wear off, but man, oh man, what a what a journey and what a, what a crazy trip. And like I said, from this ridiculous conversation at a network to something, right. I believe that people crave freshness. Yes. I really do. I really believe in the, in, you know, in original programming and original, we're, we're, you know, networks tend to do derivative stuff. They tend to do copycat stuff yeah. and it drives me nuts because I never, I, I don't think. Social media is doing that now too. Social media is doing it as well. Social yeah. media is doing those copycats and those derivatives and those different things. So, and you're talking about original. So here's the last question after you. So, what are the other projects? What's what what are what are Arthur Smith's goals moving forward? He's accomplished all these things in TV. You got a lot more years ahead of you that you're gonna be doing this. Do you have a like a, a goal that you want to reach? <laughs> so look at that. I brought up the whole reach for Arthur. It's a good word. It's a good word. Are you gonna be the president of some organization someday? Or are we looking at you running a TV organization? To no, the, uh, definitely not. Deal. Definitely not. Okay. Listen, I've been there. I've, I've, I was the head of program production and news at Fox Sports. I was a senior executive at Universal. I learned by doing those jobs that that's not what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I like making stuff. I'm a maker. And by the way, that's why the book has been such a pleasure because the book is an outlet for me. I'm all about creating and trying to do something. The book represents a chapter in my life where I'm trying to mentor more, inspire more, give back pay it forward. As a matter of fact, all the proceeds from the book are going to a foundation that I set up called the Reach Foundation. And the Reach Foundation gives money to six charities. All of these charities lift people up in some way. And, and that's what I want to spend my time on. 
I'm still going to produce shows. I like the action too much. My wife won't let me stay in the and house. And what shows are you producing right now? Um, Hell's Kitchen 22nd season, American Ninja Warriors on its 15th season. We have a show on TLC called Welcome to Platform. We actually have a new show that was just announced that's from your old life. It's uh, We're working with the WWE um, and a show called Future, Future Stars, or I think it's Future Stars. We keep changing the title, maybe Future Superstars. And it's about the recruiting process of of the WWE. And now, you know, they recruit these high level athletes and they bring them to a training camp and yeah. they do it right before WrestleMania. Right. And you're probably familiar with this. And then and they train them. And and and, and it, we, we shot 70 percent of the show already. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's kind of like the hard knocks. Right. You know, the hard the HBO show of WWE. It, yeah. It's a completely different thing in the sense that and that, it's know, a lot different than the days of mtv and tough enough so again i was yeah. in the 90s in the the attitude era and what's sad about professional wrestling is if you're going to go get the world-class athletes to do it it's going to work it's going to work that's wwe shtick it's going to bring professional wrestling back that's my yeah. prediction at one point somebody and especially you remember in canada how popular pro wrestling was sure. i worked for the and, and a lot of guys from canada uh, I, I ended up working with back in the day. I believe that it's amazing that these broadcast athletes put the best professional wrestlers, what the fans enjoy, and these things. And it's interesting. But I'm in, I'm intrigued by it for sure. I've had Triple H on my show. I've had Stone Cold on my show working yeah, with NBC. Yeah. I worked, you yeah. know, just a six minute interview. But you know the tour thing. But I yeah. know the, uh, some of these guys that were closest to this, and I think it's going to be interesting to see where pro wrestling goes. Pro wrestling misses the showmanship, the story. The yeah. flares, all that. Do you think that will ever be created again? You know it's what I mean? Always, it, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And Neil, you when you come to LA, you and I have we have to go out for sure because we, we 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 can talk some we can talk some good stories. I have about. some big news, big things coming for me. I know not to the level you're at yet, but I'm not giving up. I'm 50, and I got I got one thing that I have is connections, and there's opportunity. And I, I love interviewing people and I've done over 9,000 plus interviews. I'm number 11 celebrity podcaster world, according to Feedspot now. And I want to go next further because I can have a conversation with anybody, anytime, anywhere. It's just my gift. And I enjoy That's it. Great. That's and, great. That's and, great. And, and I teach people like David how to do this. And I teach other people as well. But I would say to you as pro, this pro wrestling idea, hopefully please let your publicist know to get me on the, uh, the list when you're going to do the promotion of it, any of yeah. your projects, I'm happy to do yeah. anything with Hell's Kenton, American Ninja Warrior. I've worked with them before. I've had a lot of your, your top stars on and different things. And I also had somebody who was one of the other producers. It'll come to me in a second. I was uh, so I probably that's how you got on my list to interview. But the best place people can go right now and purchase your book, where can they go? Uh, books are available anywhere, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, your local bookstore, any, anywhere you would normally buy a book. So, um, but, but thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, you're you're going to love the, you're going to love the WWE show. It's really, it's so good. I, and so authentic and so pure and stuff like that. And, and, and by the way, it's, they, they spend, and you, you would appreciate this. And who am I telling you, you know, way more about this than I do. There's, there's this whole element where they work on the showmanship and they work on the promo and they work on the character and you see that process and it's great. And every and everybody's in it. I mean, Triple H is in it and Lemiz is in it. And, you know, the, 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 and by the way, I had such a good time working with the WWE. I remember when Tough Enough, Tough Enough wasn't our show. We have a, we've done a lot of shows and we're like in terms of sports and entertainment, you know, we've done more than anybody else. And I always wanted to do something with the WWE. And uh, and this was the one I went to them and said, you know, instead of bringing Tough Enough back, they, you know, the last Tough Enough wasn't very good. Um, and um uh, but but I liked the show when it was on years ago. Um, and and I said, you know, you know what you need to do? You need to do something really authentic and really show the process. And you guys already do this anyhow. Let us come in and, and just follow these stories. Um, and uh, it, it, it turned out great. We're still shooting it because they, you know, 10 of them, 10 of the people who went to camp got contracts. And then when they get the contracts, it's so emotional. It's so incredible when they find out that, the, that they're going to train in Orlando. It's it's like they won the lottery. And then now we're following um, the select few in Orlando. That's the last part of the, of, of, of the shoot that's going to happen over the next few months. 
Well, fantastic. So, Let me know when that tour happens and all that stuff, the interview and all that stuff. And some of the guys that were, you know, like Adam Pierce, if you ran into Adam, Adam and I, we uh, worked down when he was 19 and I'd wrestled him in Grand Rapids, Michigan, then hit with Rhino. And then we'd head out and we'd work a town out in Canada, <laughs> everywhere. So I did the Indies, retired in Bremen, Germany, and I lost my voice now. <laughs> That's unbelievable. But best place again, Arthur is work. Get the book anywhere. I appreciate ha ha you guys having me on. Um, I hope it inspires people. It's all money's going to charity too, so it's kind of nice. Um, but uh, I think there's some some good takeaways. So once again, thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it, Arthur. Uh, you're listening and watching the Neil Haley Show. We'll be back in just a moment.